So I'd like to thank the companies, both um, NPI and Fluicell, for inviting me to um, give this seminar and present some of our data. We have actually been in contact with um, Fluicell already very early on. You've just seen that Fluicell had been founded in 2012. And in 2015, we purchased the first Biopen. I think it was um, a very early on serial number. Um, and Gavin back then came even to Würzburg when I was there um, to see um, what microscopes we had and, and paid us a site visit. And um, um, I moved only a few years ago to Jena. So I would like to start my uh, presentation with a very general introduction of a few slides and then go into the biological background and actually the use of the biopen. So um, Jena is located um, somewhere centrally in Germany. So this is Berlin. You find uh, Munich down here, Nuremberg in between and Frankfurt. So we have a long distance to travel to all of these things, but it's a nice location. We're located in a, in a really nice valley. And you see the research campus already here. Um, this is um, an, an the main research hub of, the, uh, of Thüringen. Um, so we have two Max Planck institutes here. Uh, we have um, two Fraunhofer Institutes, three Leibniz Institutes. So there's a um, real big um, emphasis on, and um, one of the, the main um, focus of the university is optics and photonics. And um, um, around here at this corner, you will see the headquarter of Carl Zeiss located of the microscopy company, and we collaborate with them as well. So this, this is my office actually, where I'm sitting right now and, and talking to you. And this is a an, an research uh, merger of the university and the university hospital to combine the strengths of um, biological science and medical science in, in one hub. Um, when we talk about um, conformational sensors, um, why do we actually study protein-protein interaction and conformational changes of GPCRs in living cells? Um, I've printed here or I've shown here a graphic of the three major classes of uh, membrane receptors that actually translate information from the outside to the inside, uh, among them ion channels, G protein coupled receptors, and enzyme link receptors, which most of you will know as tyrosine kinase receptors. My particular emphasis on G protein coupled receptors, because they are a very, um, very important class of receptors for cellular communication. And um, there are more than 800 different GPCRs in your human body, so different classes. Uh, which are basically involved in physiological control of um, any function that you can think of, be it uh, neurotransmission or um, your visual system, the reception of odorants or anything else. Most of this is controlled by GPCRs and they need to translate a signal from the outside to a signal to the inside. And they couple via different G proteins um, and can evoke intracellular signaling cascades like rice and cyclic AMP or calcium leading to a contraction or the phosphorylation of different proteins. The reason why we're interested in this is more than 30% of all marketed drugs work through these receptors because you can guess that when they're involved in so many different processes um, that the drug companies have targeted them already to um, bring back um, pathophysiological functions to normal and um, or at least to hold the disease progression. And this is, this is really why we, are study, uh, why we are studying G protein coupled receptors. The translation of information from the outside is achieved by ligand binding. And there has to be a conformational change to translate this information on the outside to something that's readable on the inside and then for the recruitment of downstream effectors and starting a signaling cascade. So for us, in molecular cell biology or in pharmacology, where, where in Würzburg, where I was hosted before, this is a crucial part because the change here in conformation dictates on what happens inside the cell. And therefore, of course, the hope is to be able to control this in a reasonable manner to maybe even select um, individual signaling pathways. The um, other reason why we study this is um, in combination with uh, medicinal chemists we are developing compounds that may actually um, select certain functions or block individual states of these um, signaling cascades. Um, I will focus on a very early step um, in, in my presentation that we analyzed a chemokine receptor for the um, effect of ligand binding in this conformational change and then what happens with the G, pro the G protein. There is of course a lot more to study 
but um, I will just focus today on this initial part and um, I will show you some of the details. The reason um, or the, the way we do this is by actually generating first since based um, sensors. And I've just shown you here um, one of the um, general schemes how you can actually label different receptors. Um, this is a size of a G protein coupled receptor. This is currently how many people label them with antibodies. And you can see this is a huge size. Um, we will use fluorescent proteins and a small organic fluorescent dye to have minimal invasion on these uh, proteins. There are alternative tags um, like uh, luciferases or snap tech and clip tech, which you can buy um, from other companies. And this is um, just in quantum dot to emphasize the size difference here. So we would like to be as minimal invasive as possible. And therefore, um, I first show you CFP and YFP are the um, frequently used fluorophores. Um, that's the basis of FRET. So you have to have an absorption spectra and an emission spectra. And the emission spectra of the um, donor needs to overlap with the acceptor spectra. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if that is correct and in the right um, distance between the two fluorophores, you will get a nice FRET signal. And the distance depends, of course, on the combination of fluorophores. And there is an optimum um, where you actually can insert your um, fluorophores. Um, because if you are around the so-called first array use, which gives you the half maximal um, signal, then you get for a short distance change, the largest signal change actually. Um, so for us as people in the lab cloning those sensors, that means this part is the majority of work to optimize um, your, your sensors um, for a function. <clears throat> What I do differently to most people in labeling is I do not only use um, the gene uh, green fluorescent proteins, but um, I was visiting Roger Tsien's lab um, in 2003 and uh, was trained on a technology which was called flash labeling. So we use a small organic fluorophore, which is called fluorescein arsenical hairpin binder. And this fluorophore can be tagged with six amino acids only instead of 230 amino acids, and therefore you are less invasive. The advantage for us in, in this today's talk is that um, the signal amplitude that we obtain from receptors um, being cloned with these technologies is about fivefold of what we would get with a CFP YFP sensor. So thereby these receptors are suitable, suitable for in kinetic analysis, as well as uh, concentration response curves of ligands. Um, with respect to the kinetics, they would not be different, but this is, of course, more difficult to analyze than such a signal um, because you have a higher signal to noise ratio. The type of microscope we use is actually um, in, in custom built uh, microscope where we have a camera up here and an opto split in here, um, then a, a light source. And um, you can see here already the conventional uh, perfusion system, which we use. Um, from NPI for, um, let's say, not so costful ligands. Um, in this device here, you have reservoirs that take five milliliters of solution, so small, diffusible, and commercial ligands we can use with this system. What you can see here is a small tip um, of 200 nano, uh, micrometer diameter as, as an, um, that we use for regular application to cells, and then here, the recording device on the side. And I hope this video runs. That's a um, video where you can see actually here CFP and here Flash. The poster who did the work is Armut Gutbole in my lab. And um, so he perfused an adenosine receptor. And I hope this live recording works and does not kill the stream. So we can see here is an on rate and an off rate when we start perfusing a ligand and an on rate, uh, off rate again. So if I start the video, you might be able to see that we have an on rate coming on here. This is a video that was taken with a cell phone. Um, so you can see the actual uh, experiment on screen, how it's done. It's really live cell. And here Armod stops the perfusion and the ligand um, diffuses off again or is washed off. So I stopped the video here. I hope you could see this um, as it was developing. And um, in, for the sake of time, um, I just analyzed that or Armut analyzed that if we do a concentration here with adenosine at different concentrations, you see for low concentrations, we get a bit of an answer. And then um, following 
theory, the on rate becomes faster, the higher the ligand concentration is, while the off rate stays constant. This was done with the regular perfusion system, not with the NPI system, because adenosine is a very cheap ligand. Then we wanted to turn to a chemokine receptor. And there we already have a problem because one microgram of a ligand of this chemokine receptor would cost you around 3,000 euros. That is nothing you would put in a five milliliter tube because you can do exactly one experiment and then you purchase the next milligram. Um, so this was actually the, the reason why we got in contact quite early on with um, Fluicel and, and Gavin to have a look at the uh, perfusion system that we actually heard rumors of would exist and, and could be used. And the reason um, why we're interested in this chemokine receptor is um, it's an important receptor in breast cancer and um, particularly in metastasis. And there is an antagonist now finally in clinical, tri uh, in, in clinical use um, because a lot of women suffer from metastasis in bone um, because this receptor um, allows these cells to migrate and migrate toward um, um, a gradient where this ligand is actually highly expressed. And doctors would normally look for liver or lung tumors or brain metastasis in kidney because these are the organs where blood flow would limit um, flow and the cells might have a place to settle. Um, bone is not really on the list of organs where metastasis would form but these cells migrate in there. And this is really um, due to this receptor and thereby blockade and understanding this receptor is vital um, for us um, to cure that. So having said this, we actually started this project in 2015 when a PhD student joined my lab in an ITN funded or an EU funded network, Christina Pepina, and I will show you um, just a figure in a second. So this ligand binds to this receptor and by the start of the project, the crystal structure became available. So we had seen from colleagues that in inside here in this receptor, this is where the dynamic happens in the third intracellular loop. When a ligand binds on the outside, this is the place where the downstream signaling uh, molecules would bind. And we saw you can insert something in there. So Christina analyzed these receptors and then started to clone. And um, so this is a photo of Christina. And what she did was she actually took this third intracellular loop and inserted at several positions um, a flash site um, that we could actually label. So this is now called 226, 228, and 229 for the site where she actually inserted the six amino acids. What she then did um, was to characterize this guy here where we now have a sensor that would respond with a change in FRET, hopefully. Um, when we apply a ligand. So you can see is, um, the expression in cells. And you can see also that this um, flash labeling, if you look into it in, in confocal microscopy, gives you a slight staining, um, and, but you can still see that there is specific labeling. What Christina did then was to determine the FRET efficiency so that we could actually um, get when, um, what our signal would be like. We expected this signal to be here between four or five percent from from our uh, previous knowledge um, that we had with 18 other sensors for other GPCRs that we had generated. She also, of course, did then G protein activation and um, in different assays to show that this receptor is about tenfold less than signaling, but nonetheless responds well with respect to ligand binding. Now the pipette comes into play because we need to stimulate this receptor. Design of the pipette is pretty easy. You have, or I should not say pretty easy, but it's straightforward. I think it's very difficult to manufacture. But what you have is three openings. Through one opening, the actual liquid is, uh, liquid is applied. And through these two outsides, the liquid is absorbed, which leads to a defined um, bubble in front of your uh, pipette. And you can engulf a single cell in that. You need this holder. And that's shown here on the um, other side. Since we purchased an early version, um, for, for your work, you can use the first four um, vials here and the uh, remaining vials are for waste deposit because of course you have to deposit your waste that you absorb again. Uh, but as I've heard, there is now another version where you have more um, vials for actual working. The solution then you can use this on slices or you can use this on single cell. We use this on single cell. Uh, but it's a very small amount of solution required because it recirculates. 
And that's the huge advantage. Um, our experience is that with this volume of 35 microliters, you can work for an entire day on um, different experiments without needing to refill it because it only has a few nanoliters um, of liquid here in front and um, that's um, the advantage. And um, since you have three or four in our version, four different solutions, you can use one of these solutions for your buffer to maintain the resting state. And then you can add an agonist in different concentrations or even put an agonist and an antagonist in here to do switching of different solutions at the single cell level. Um, this is what it looks like um, when you have the different solutions. Um, I will not run this for long, but you can see that um, you can have a green solution, yellow or red. So you can, in one second, it should start switching faster to show you how fast actually um, solution exchange can be. But up here, now, now it starts. Up here, you can see the aspiration of the volume um, that's going in. Um, so this is actually a, a video that I stole from Fluicell um, when Gavin was visiting us and, and um, advertising this um, video. The second one is just the size of the bubble that you can create so you are flexible. You can even put in multiple cells or even single cells and you can maintain this also very, very stable um, for the time of your experiment. Um, so having shown this, I start now with the actual experiment. We now have our pipette here on this um, receptor. We have expressed these receptors in regular HEC-293 cells. Um, by a normal transfection reagent, we used effectane. And then we did our staining protocol with flash and actually exposed the ligand at this small black uh, bar here. That's the time frame where Christina applied the ligand. And you can see that there is a rapid change in the ratio. And you can see this here as well in blue and yellow um, going to the opposite side. So this is a real indication of FRET. And then you can analyze the on rate here, which Christina has done. And the on rate is in the range of 600 milliseconds. That is perfectly fine. There is no, um, no um, delay or something by this perfusion in this time scale. If you go to much faster um, time scales of a millisecond or two, then you have to use different perfusion systems. But for our um, regular use, this is totally fine. And then she also quantified the off rate, and this is in range of 20 seconds. So this is a number that I would like you to remember, 600 milliseconds for the activation of this receptor. Of course, we have to do control experiments to make sure that our signal is really coming from this receptor alone. So therefore, Christina cloned two constructs which either carry the fluorophore in, um, for flash, uh, or sorry, the binding sequence for flash, or the CFP and co-expression um, does not lead to an increase um, upon bleaching. So this is chemical bleaching where we detach this fluorophore. You can see this here declining, but CFP is not increasing. While when you have both in the same molecule, you see the CFP fluorescence increasing which means that all our signal really comes from, an, from a uh, subunit in this, um, or in, from one receptor, not a dimer. Then she started to analyze G protein receptor coupling because this is the ultimate next step. So you have an active receptor now, now you have coupling of the G protein and the receptor. And you can see here again, FRET um, in both settings where we tag the receptor and the gamma subunit or the receptor and the alpha subunit. And this was totally un uh, unexpected because suddenly we see a decrease. And this is counterintuitive because if you are provoking FRET between two uh, partners that should interact, you should expect an increase, not a decrease. So therefore we compared these two settings, but nonetheless, in both cases, we have a decrease, which meant that they were probably pre-coupling already in a resting state. Both of these settings gave us an activation kinetic of 1.2 seconds. So compared to ligand binding and activation of 600 milliseconds, we are a step smaller, slower of 1.2 seconds. So Christina analyzed this further to convince ourselves that the perfusion system is okay and not by switching the different perfusion systems um, between um, uh, our long uh, publication list that there was a difference here. And we used the alpha 2A receptor, which we had analyzed with an um, perfusion system, a different one already years ago. That was mainly Moritz Bühnemann's work um, here, Peter Hein et al. 
And um, so the activation kinetic, um, we could actually recapitulate um, for the receptor G protein coupling. And um, you see here an increase as expected and published and the decrease here for CXCR4. So we are sure that this is a different type of biology going on. So therefore, Christina used now an bleaching experiment where she looked at these two receptors. This is steady state. This is not with a perfusion, but she basically bleached this fluorophore. And um, you can see here an increase in CFP fluoros on the G protein. So they must have been interacting before. If she puts in an antagonist of the receptor under the same circumstances and then bleaches, there is no increase in fluorescence, which means she can discouple this, this state by putting in an antagonist. And then a control experiment, again, the alpha 2A receptor, which we had shown before was not pre-coupling, didn't show any pre-coupling. So it's another evidence that there is some interaction between the receptor and the G protein already. But something happens within tau of 1.2 seconds in this complex upon ligand application. So the next step in your signaling cascade that I've introduced you to would be the G protein activation. And here again, we used um, tools that we had in the lab from Joachim Göder from Amsterdam, uh, where we have here GI coupled receptors tagged within CFP and YFP based fluorophore. And you can see here a decrease that is not coming back and the alpha 2A receptor again a decrease but in dynamic one. Um, so that means here we have something else going on compared to the alpha 2A receptor. Um, the main point that I need to raise is um, here the kinetics are in the range of four seconds compared to an alpha 2A receptor which is in the range of 600 milliseconds for a tau that's an exact match of the uh, previously published um, data. So we have a gap here between the interaction of the receptor and the G protein and the activation of about three seconds. So we were scratching our heads to try and explain this and um, here just some plate reader assays to quantify this with respect to the ligand. So we were scratching our heads and thought what could be the reason actually for this dismatch in, in time scales. Um, because for all other receptors, we have seen a very, very rapid switch on, even for peptide receptors like the PTH receptor, this is much faster. So an idea came up that we might actually use a dimer and receptors of this class can dimerize. And so Christina cloned um, two C-terminal tagged uh, receptors with a C-terminus of CFP and YFP and then expose the ligand to it and again aspirated it using this um, biopen from Fluisa. You can see again a very nice uh, FRET trace here. The on rate could be analyzed and the on rate is in the range of 1.6 seconds. So it falls in between the complex rearrangement of G protein and receptor in, in the interaction and the G protein activation. So this then led us to uh, propose a model where we have actually here ligand binding where we do not know how rapid this is uh, because we can't um, use or we can't currently visualize the ligand, but we are working on this. And um, here we have the activation of the receptor. This is the receptor G protein complex with an um, tau of about one second. And then this dimer rearrangement would kinetically fit immediately in between here. And then we have the activation of the G protein. So this is an kind of an attractive hypothesis, which we may utilize actually for further drug development. Of course, we are collaborating also with immunologists. So they were interested in a compound, which is called MIF, which they call macrophage migration inhibitor factor. And it has been proposed and shown actually by ligand binding that it also interacts with the CXCO4 receptor. So here now is the strength of our approach because the pipette can hold four different solutions. So we can use MIF in one tube, CXCL12 in the other tubing, and then expose the two ligands on the same cell having the same identical protein content and um, transfection. And it's just a single cell. And what you can see here is the structure. MIF is an, um, a non-conventional chemokine, so it kind of harbors and a bit, bit of the basic structure of chemokines, but it does not contain the motifs that actually allow you to classify this as a chemokine. Nonetheless, we did the experiments and you can see here on the left, again, our receptor construct, 
If you apply MIFU, we get a negative result on the same cell line CXCL12 leads to an increase. And here's the kinetic analysis for MIF. If we use the receptor G protein interaction assay, MIF shows an increase and CXCL12 shows a decrease. It's just the same cell line. There's nothing you can argue about being different protein contents or anything. Um, it's just the opposite direction. And again, the kinetic analysis. And the next steps would then be this dimer rearrangement. MIF does exactly the opposite to CXCL12. Uh, and MIF doesn't activate the G protein. So we can distinguish these two ligands now just based on our single cell experiments using the sensors. And according to our findings, we would characterize MIF not as an activating ligand, at least with respect to G protein activation, uh, but it binds and induces different states. And um, colleagues of us um, have, um, which whom we collaborated, I've picked up on this dimer rearrangement and just published a publication in, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, where they can actually target sub pockets here of the binding pocket and actually um, selectively destroy a dimer and bring this into a monomeric state. And this is going to be quite exciting um, when, when it comes to therapeutic um, use. Um, this work that I'm just presenting you um, was published in August. And um, we were also um, asked um, whether we, we could present a figure for the cover figure. And this is um, really a very nice highlight for a PhD thesis um, to be honored with a cover figure in, in such a prestigious journal. And here you can see just the presentation um, of how we can visualize the different kinetic steps. And of course, this is um, now interesting with respect to um, treatment options for these receptors. Um, that we might have identified an additional state of this receptor that can be targeted by small molecules and we can actually gain control of um, the different states. Of course, we don't do this alone. This is my group in Jena. Um, most work um, that I've presented you was done by Christina Pepina Viziano and Armut Gutbule as the postdoc um, who is now picking up on these things and um, Nureddin Yusuf in our funding from the uh, EU who is following her on, on these steps. And of course, vital teams um, for collaboration, uh, long-term collaborators and my former mentor, Martin Lose, who is now in Berlin. Um, and of course here, people in Amsterdam and in Nottingham who were involved in this. And funding is very important. Um, of course, um, we are involved in collaborative research centers. Um, Receptor Dynamics was a network funded by the state of Bavaria and EU uh, funding, Novo Nordisk was in, interested in, in funding us for a kinetic project. And of course, also um, EU funding. More interesting and important is the current group because they follow um, and, and are currently working on these and um, there's more to come. So with this, I would like to um, stop my sharing and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hoffman, for, for, for your presentation. This was very interesting. And I have to say that you have uh, videos that we've never seen. <laughs> so I see now that uh, Gavin is laughing, but uh, <laughs> we, we, we will definitely have to, to have those videos back because they are super demonstrating on, on uh, what's the bio, what, what the BioPen uh, can do. Yeah. And they are really talking, and we've never seen those. So that they are incredibly describing what you can do with the bio. So um, maybe, uh, so maybe Gavin, you have a question, I think, right? So we can start with him. And if anyone has a question, then yeah, you are on mute, I think. So we. We can't hear you. We can't hear you, uh, Gavin. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we do. Yeah, it's not liking the headset. Um, uh, so thank you, uh, Professor Hoffman. It's it's uh, it's good to see your work again. Yeah, it's been a few years since we <laughs> we started this journey, so <clears throat> it's exciting to see how things are are, are going and things. So uh, I had a, a one question, and it, and it kind of relates. Uh, kind of to multiple points that you, you have raised during your, your talk, um, uh, particularly around this, this kind of dimer uh, formation. And, and as you described at the start, um, 
with the G protein activation, there's actually a, a cascade process which happens. Uh, it's not just a single step thing. That um, I was actually wondering if there's been studies or if there is like a kind of a role of the, you know, the membrane, like how the reorganization, you know, um, uh, has, let's say, um, elements of the kind of fluidity of the membrane or the local microenvironment of, of the membrane, um, uh, you know, as well as uh, the kind of possible other like dimerization. So like if, let's say the uh, properties of the membrane change, does it change the way that the G protein activation works? There is, this is just a field that's beginning um, to be elucidated. Of course, um, there may be influences of the uh, membrane structure um, people start to appreciate membrane curvature as a certain force and um, some lipids may enrich in, in structures that are bended inwards or outwards and um, of course receptors might feel more comfortable in, in certain um, areas of the membrane then there are crystal structures out which show for instance that um, cholesterol has a um, tendency to bind to um, several of these GPCRs and um, that's also been um, studied with functional respects, then um, I think for with respect to dimer inf or influence of lipids to dimers, it's too early to say. What we currently see is that, um, that there is um, no clear rule of which receptors will dimerize or not, um, but um, there is an influence of the expression level for some of the receptors, which of course, if you have more receptors in the membrane then they they have to find uh, each other um, more often but there are also uh, several receptors which have a natural affinity to each other and and um, some of these um, heterodimers serve actually different functions than individual receptors so this is a very interesting area but um, since you can imagine we have 800 different subtypes and if you start to do the combinatorial of that um, we need more postdocs and probably <laughs> more professors to do all this stuff. And um, but it's it's a very interesting area of research. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. No, it's me. Then thank you, uh, Prof. Fan, and thank you, Gavin, for for for, for this question. Um, I, 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 if there is any other question, you can use the Q and R uh, uh, button on uh, button on the bottom of the. Uh, of the Zoom conversation. And I think that uh, Dr. Loser, you have as well a, a question for Prof. Hoffman, right? That's right. Um, it might be a stupid question, a very simple one, but um, all the kinetics you showed, um, the on time was always a lot faster than the off time. And I was wondering why this is, because this does not yet involve the G protein coupling and all this what comes afterwards. It's only the receptor itself and the conformation of changes. Why, why is there still such a big difference? Um, that's because, I mean, your affinity of a ligand is, is a product of um, on rate and off rate. And so there, if you have an, a low affinity ligand, they would dissociate much faster. Um, and, and this is most of the times where we see the difference. We have also come across a few ligands where we have a different in the on rate, but um, affinity is, is really something which now with these techniques surprises us. You find ligands with a similar affinity if you do an, an balanced and, and, and um, determination at equilibrium, um, you, would uh, you would conclude that they have the same affinity, um, but they do have very different on and off rates. And we're just starting to um, look into that we also have a, pro uh, a project on um, adenosine receptors where we particularly look at allosteric modulators put on top of agonists to look at their modulation of off rate. Um, because for industry, this is a very interesting um, question. Off rate is um, re linked to residence time and residence time is linked to most of the times duration of drug action. And um, if you look into the literature, for failures of drug development in, in early phases is um, you have an affinity, but you do not have an efficacy. And um, this is very important to keep in mind. You offer it um, as well. We, we are actually able by taking off the ligand completely to distinguish between um, the effects of rebinding and um, of dissociation because if your ligand is around in the solution, it has, of course, a certain affinity and would rebind and, and lead to an, an falsification of your off rate. Um, 
that's another advantage of the pipette because it really takes out this um, the ligand and um, does not leave it in. And um, with the other perfusion system, um, this AXA-8, for instance, we, we apply the ligand and then it stays in the bath solution. Um, so it would accumulate over time. And we had to pay also um, some experience on that for very, very high affinity ligands in the nanomolar range where we did a miscalculation and applied way too high concentrations and then the experiment stopped after one cell. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So we have another question from uh, uh, Jenna Kirsch. Uh, so do you see any me uh, mechanical disturbance uh, of the cell due to the solution stream? within the bubble in front of the pipette or are the cells sitting tight enough on the surface to the chamber bottom? Um, we have to attach the cells with polylysine. So this is, this is something which we use um, to um, kind of flatten the cells and, and make them more adherent. Um, but within, um, within um, this biopen, we have seen way less disturbance than with other perfusion systems, because it's simply an, an amount of liquid that you would let the cells pass. And um, this, in this sense, the fluid cell is way more gentle than other perfusion systems. You just have to calculate easily if we, like the perfusion system that I had shown, um, where we have the five milliliter perfusion, um, you may go through half a milliliter in, in one or two minutes and just the flow rate um, would be much faster. So sometimes with the old system, we even lost cells um, because they were not attached um, good enough. And with the biopen, we've never seen uh, a loss of cells. 